Thank you for tuning in to our Meet the Author event tonight. We have uh, Gordon Hess, who is the author of A Sonnet in the Sands, Island Beach State Park. And my name is Grace Ann Taylor. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at St. Barnegat Bay. And I'll be hosting Gordon tonight as we talk about his book and show some images. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box below if you're on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, go ahead and put it in the comments. I'll be monitoring that as well. And then uh, if you don't catch it live, you can check it out on our Facebook and also on our Save Running Bay YouTube channel. So thank you so much for being here. All right, Gordon. So would you like to start with questions or photos first? Um, well, I guess just general questions would be a good place to start. All right. So why don't we start off with some that I had and get the crowd going, and then we'll see okay. if anyone else has other questions. Um, all right, so Gordon, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and, and just kind of what your, what your career life was like. Okay, I grew up in Lavalette. Um, I started journalism in the fourth grade. Um, we were so terribly bored in the winter in Lavalette. Uh, back then, the winter population, was, it seemed like it was about 125. And uh, we were bored and we started the Lavalette Junior Press. So that was my first experiences doing writing outside of school assignments. And uh, um, I ended up going to do uh, Clemson to study architecture. I uh, got through the third semester of calculus and decided I was an English major. And uh, so I finished my career with a degree in English with a fine arts minor. And uh, I've always kind of enjoyed writing and researching, and uh, probably my, my career was probably moved along. I was a probation officer in Ocean County uh, for several years. I ran, uh, I did pre-sentence investigations that got me uh, used to interviewing people, uh, writing profiles, things of that nature. And then uh, um, I did a lot of jobs as a public re relations director um, springboarding off of my work as a probation officer. Uh, I worked for Kimball Medical Center. I was their director of public relations. And uh, what else? Then I came over to um, work for Fellows Reed out of Tom's River, the uh, surveyors, engineers, and environmental sciences people, and ended up getting a job um, working for Lincoln University, the oldest historically black college in the country. And uh, most recently, I worked for the YMCA of Delaware and the Newcastle County Library System. So I, I have, uh, some people would describe it as a checkered background. Uh, it's, it's been all over the place. But uh, as I moved around in life, um, I never lost my love of the shore. I lifeguarded for almost 10 years. So I spent a lot of time looking at that body of water and I can't get enough of it. And unfortunately in Delaware, I don't get to see it too much. Everybody here goes to Rehoboth. They, they go to the beach, we go to the shore. So I was just gonna say, what is your connection to the Jersey Shore and how, how is that, um, you know, obviously that segues into how you wrote a sonnet in the sands. I, I guess it's because at a certain point it seemed, uh, one being, going to college in South Carolina, there's a great deal of self-pride about South Carolina. They started the, the Confederacy, uh, the war, uh, the Civil War, and uh, they were always bragging about their state and how individual they were and how wonderful, and it seemed like New Jersey was always the punchline to a joke, and it, it uh, kind of bugs me, and I feel like there ought to be a little bit more pride uh, shared about New Jersey. So um, that's where my first book came from. That was All Summer Long Tales and Lore of Lifeguarding on the Atlantic. That was pretty much a dunk shot because I'd lifeguarded for so long. I knew a lot of lifeguards and I went back to lifeguards all the way from the 1930s to around 2003, 2004. And uh, a big part of that was the transition of women lifeguards on the ocean. So it was kind of marking these steps that had changed lifeguarding. Right. Um, and that involved interviewing three, three dozen lifeguards. So that, that got me into writing, and that's where I met the publisher, George Valente, who published this book. 
after doing that, occasionally he'd say, do you want to do an article about this or about that? Or I'd say, you know, I think you ought to do something about Island Beach uh, for a short article. And he said, well, that's interesting you mentioned that. I've always wanted to do a book about Island Beach. Maybe it's my last great book. And so we did an article for his uh, magazine. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Yeah, definitely. If you have it, show us. You get it. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks like this. You can see it. I Oops. can't even see it there. You know what? It's your, your yeah. screen, your background. Fragmenting. Yeah. Anyway, that's Jersey Shore Magazine. So I've written about beach replenishment, uh, Sandy Hook Lighthouse, which is the oldest continuously operating lighthouse in the country. Uh, the Twin Towers, which are unique. They were important in the introduction of uh, using radio. Um, because it's the highest point on the East Coast from Montauk Point to Mexico. So th these, these are bragging points for New Jersey. Um, then, uh, anyway, I started working on the Island Beach book. I thought this would be a one-year project, and three and a half years later, it was done. It, it just grew in scope. Uh, who knew there was so much about this place to, to learn about? So that leads me to my next question, which is what was the most challenging thing about writing this? I mean, you cover everything from the people to the history to the current events. I mean, everything feels like it's there. So that had to be difficult. What was the most challenging thing? It was developing a network system. There were a lot of people that didn't know something, but they knew somebody that did. So it, it was chasing that down, uh, dealing with a strong amount of opposition from people in the shacks. They didn't want publicity. They were concerned. They were they were concerned that too much publicity would kind of ruin the good thing that they had going. And yeah. uh, so it was very hard to get people to interview, or they'd interview me with me, but didn't want their names used, that kind of thing. So uh, that probably more than anything, it was that, and trying to get photographs of the uh, uh, Phipps Mansion, the governor's place. Uh, because uh, Governor Christie was, uh, at that point, a presidential contender, and this was security, and uh, they didn't want to give me pictures, and ultimately I ended up uh, contacting the Ocean County Air Support Squadron and said, said, say, when you're flying by, would you mind get a picture with the sun in this position? And four hours later, they got me the picture. So... Hi. Um, that, that that was one of the great victories is getting those pictures. Yeah, as I was reading about uh, the shacks, I definitely was wondering how that went with the with with people there because you know it is such a special place and they have special pride there. And so when I was reading about all the names, I was wondering how you, you must have made some really good connections over there to <laughs> have them allow you to publish their stories so so nicely. Um, yeah, there were a couple that were very willing, and then there were old records, for example, in the personnel office. Um, they had some rusty old file cabinets, and things were all out of place, and things were missing. But one of the articles mentioned that they had had, um, they had, had a fire, and one of the shacks had burnt down by accident. And uh, in the newspaper clipping, it said it was the first fire there in about seven years when 13 places went up in flames. And I'm thinking, they had a hat of an arsonist to do that. And as it turns out, when people vacated their places in the old days, they used to just burn them. Right. Oh, man. And, and then now with the EPA, we can't do that because you're dealing with asbestos issues and things of that nature. Right. So, and that leads me to the next question, which is, who were your key partners? I mean, you had a lot of moving parts. You said networking was one of the challenging pieces. So who were the key key groups or people? Uh, it's hard to put it on any one. Um, um, the top, Ray, the top few. Ray Bukowski was very helpful. He's very nice. My first day meeting him, he took me on a quick tour of the park. And that was the first time I saw the judges shack. Um, and then as a result of that, I ended up meeting the people that were taking care of maintaining it, trying to keep it from falling apart. And uh, now I'm involved in that group on the side as well. Um, uh, so so that all the, the people associated with that, Bill Bolger, um, who's with, uh, I, I won't get it right, 
but but he was he's a retired but he had worked for uh, the federal government i think on historic sites gotcha. um, uh, that was pretty much it and then just some of the personnel here a couple of the people that lived in the shacks um uh, beach buggy association those people are very very uh loyal and very helpful to the park and they came up with some tremendous photos so speaking of why don't we put some yes. up? <laughs> yeah, everybody's going to get bored of, of looking at me um yeah why don't you put them up there and we'll see how that works Okay, th this photo was a real find. Uh, going back to your question about important people, if any of you have not been there, I highly recommend going down to Beach Haven and the uh, New Jersey Maritime Museum. Uh, the woman that runs it, Debbie Whitcraft, uh, has created a museum and she's just collected all this stuff from divers and uh, books and she had this photo and uh, she just locked me in the place at night when they went out just said turn out the lights and slam the door and uh, I was scanning and I scanned this photo I said this is, a, this is really a nice photo um, it's good quality good uh, contrast but it wasn't until I put it on the computer I could read their shirts and they the shirts say Cedar Creek on them so this is a photo taken at Island Beach of an, at an uncertain time, probably between 1880 and uh, 1898. And if you go to the next picture, it'll show uh, one of the themes that I, I came across as I worked on the book is the idea of repurposing. Uh, so you talk about recycling in today's world. This uh, structure is a barn for the Reed Hotel and if you notice, it looks a lot like that life-saving station, at least the top floor. And uh, that was one of the, the uh, lifeguard shed, life-saving station, where they kept the boat and their, their tow lines and their Lyle guns. And when, when they built the big new one, uh, this one was sold off or auctioned off, and they lifted it up and made it part of the barn. But you can see a lot of the distinctive markings on it. So um, that's kind of the segue from that earlier photo. And there you can see the crops they were growing for the hotel. And uh, apparently uh, in that sandy soil, you put some fish bones and seaweed and you have some pretty good stuff to uh, grow your tomatoes with, I guess. Uh, let's see what we got next. Uh, this is the Reed Hotel. There was one that preceded it, but uh, the pictures of it are pretty a shambles. And they took the windows from the old one and put it in this one. Um, late, this picture is, does not show the apron porch that goes around uh, at least two or three sides of it. And uh, it looks like they're playing badminton there. And the tower on the top was functional. Supposedly, uh, one of the members of the Reed family, a mother, her son was crossed the bay as a storm came and she saw his boat getting caught in the storm and he did not survive. Uh, so there's uh, quite a number of uh, tragic tales that go with this place. Right. Well, it's the graveyard of the Atlantic. Uh, well, it is. People in North Carolina argue and say, no, we're the graveyard. But, <laughs> Who wants that title? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh. Okay, let's try the next one. This is an important photo because it gives the relationship with the building that still stands. Way in the background there, you can see looking towards the ocean is the life-saving station that was completed in 1898. So we know that this photo at least is from 1898 uh, or later. And there you see the wraparound porch that's been put on and you can still see the distinctive cupola uh, there as well. So, so to clarify, the, 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 the um, building in the background there, that's the maintenance station now, right? Right, right. I'd love to see it turned into a museum. I think it's such a beautiful building, uh, but uh, I know that they don't want to put up more structures uh, on the park, but I wish they would re reconsider that. Uh, really is, is that Reed Road? Pardon me? Are we looking down Reed Road? Yeah, yeah, you're looking from the bay side towards the ocean. 
And, uh, you know, for a year or so, I, I was looking at the photo. I didn't even notice the life-saving station in the background. And then when I did, it it really helped to get a sense of your, uh, your locations. Okay, let's move on. To, on. And there's the station. Uh, I didn't realize it came out so small. Uh, one of the things I did to date it, uh, the actual photo, you can count the number of stars, and there were only uh, that many at a like a three-year window, and that helped date it. I forget what it was. It might be 1906 to 1910. But it was uh, they they went up and down the coast. Uh, another thing, a point of distinction is uh, the life the very first life saving station at Island Beach was one of the first federal life saving stations, and that was passed by Congress, I believe, in 1849. All right. Okay. So I just have to zoom out really quick to get to the next photo. Oh, you blew it up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Now I have to, hmm, what's happening? Do you need to go to no. see all photos? <laughs> yeah. So um, this is uh, part of when, when things started changing there. This is the last, last stop before crossing Barnegat Bay. If you go over uh, to Ocean Gate or you look on uh, satellite maps, you can see a straight line that heads towards Seaside Park. And this would aim right at where that pier is in Seaside Park. We don't, we don't have a date for that photo, although people that know the styles of the day say it was probably around 1910 that, that was taken. But this, this was significant in another way because uh, it starts in uh, modern day tourism. All right. And uh, this is about the same time. This is the seaweed industry uh, for save Barnegat Bay people. This is uh, one of the first major upheavals in the environment there. Um, uh, this is that, that eel grass. And they found out that uh, if you washed it, you could uh, kind of mitigate the sulfur smell of it. So they would lay it on chicken wire, let it dry out after it had been washed. And uh, they would use it for coffins, to uh, to bolster the the padding, they would use it in Model T Fords on the upholstery. They used it for prison bed bedding, and a number of homes in Seaside Park they put it in the walls for insulation, and they discovered by accident that it was also a fire retardant. So if if a building caught on fire, they they found that it would it would burn out the windows, but around the walls it didn't. It, it, it retarded that. I think I heard but, once too that it was in the um, walls at Rockefeller Center. Is that true? The Rockefeller Center? Oh, yeah. you mean out at Sedge House? No, or, uh, no, 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 that it was, I don't know, rumor rumor was that it was in the walls in Rockefeller, and, and I don't know, in New York City, but who knows oh. if that's true. <laughs> I, I don't know. I know they shipped it in gigantic bales. It was real right. cheap padding that you could use for a number of different purposes. But insulation was a big one. The, the Reed Hotel, they, they, had, uh, they would store bay ice from the winter and pack this around it, and that helped keep the ice into the summertime. So it must have been pretty effective stuff. Unfortunately, it's a major food source for bran. And uh, they destroyed so much of it that um, it started uh, having a major effect on the, the, um, the flocks that were coming in there and they couldn't find is enough food. So they were, they, they were deracinating it, they were pulling it up, not just taking it off the shore when it went washed up there? I think they were just raking it in the water and pulling it up on shore and then lifting it up, hosing it, uh, probably maybe with bay water. I'm, I'm not sure how they did it. The photo is kind of deceptive because that's actually bay water there. And I think the negative was moved. Uh, it took me a long while to try and figure out how that photo came out like that. 
but you'd see it was a substantial amount there. And somebody said that they had like 500 pounds bales, which I can't even imagine moving. Uh, does anybody know who that is in that um, photo? Well, I do because I was just looking at your book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I'd heard about him for so long. It was interesting to get the image of him. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's Mr. Phipps. Uh, if you mention his name in Pittsburgh or uh, Baltimore, uh, it's well known. There's a conservancy in uh, the Pittsburgh area. He and his wife became a major philanthropic people. He grew up um, in the neighborhood of Andrew Carnegie and they became friends. And Carnegie was the operations guy and he was the, the, uh, the bean counter, so to speak. At one point he owned uh, I believe it was 19 or 29 miles um, along the Florida coast, uh, one of the chic, what, what became a chic place to be. I can't think of the name of it offhand. Um, and he did some development up in Cape Cod and I think Connecticut as well. And his next project was Island Beach, where he was going to make uh, a place for the very wealthy. So I thought we had to include him in there because a lot of people, I, I'd never seen him before uh, I found that. And, and he, he, he died, he, he bought, he consolidated mostly the land that makes up Island Beach in uh, 1926, 1927. He had the master plan drawn up. Unfortunately, we don't have it here. It is in the book. It spans two pages uh, showing golf courses and they were going to have a seaplane airport and uh, had some very ambitious plans, but uh, the stock market dropped in 1929 and he died in 1930. And so you had this man with a, an incredible amount of wealth and it took them a long time to sort out um, the will. I think I heard there were 16 to 32 people that somehow had an interest in his, his holdings after he died and that took him a long while to straighten that out during that time while his manager was running the place um, there were a number of people that realized that the place was unique and that the the dunes were going away we probably ought to go to the next picture i think that's the one i want uh, this is the fellow that's francis freeman and um um, th I'm having a senior moment here. She's the author. She wrote 42 books. They were kind of like the predecessors to um, the Nancy Drew books. Um, they were both widowers and they married. And it was interesting. You had this small 10 mile stretch of uh, fairly barren looking land and two major authors spent a, a good part Part of their time there, the other one being Pearl S. Buck. So anyway, he was probably um, what today we'd call an environmentalist, but I don't think they had that word back then. He was uh, dead set on them extending the roadway and making a bridge over to, to Barnegat, Barnegat Light. That was a hotly contested political issue. This is the only good picture I could find, and it's in a newspaper. If any of you should ever come across a, a real photo of him, I'd appreciate it. Uh, let me know, because I, I have a little bit of film with him in it as well. Um, okay, uh, this came out of a newspaper, and you can go to the next one if you would, uh, Grace Ann. This is a headline, you can't read the date there, but it's 1933, and the headline was Amid Seashores Vanishing Dunes. Can you believe that early people were sensitive to the fact that we were cutting down these dunes for uh, wealthy real estate transactions. And uh, in this article told me more about him than I found anywhere else. Uh, he was a World War um, I veteran. Uh, he was injured um, on the Eastern Front. He was a motorcycle rider and uh, lost a lot of his hearing. And that's one of the reasons he found Island Beach, such a good place to be. He didn't have to do a lot of talking. And uh, that's where I got the photo from. Uh, this, uh, this is the shack. It's a current photo of it. Originally, it was on the north side of the first life-saving station. 
the one that you know, uh, half a mile or so into the park. This was on the other side. When the state took over in 1953, um, or right before then, the judge that had bought this shack in 1942, I believe, it might have been, I think it was 42, 42, 43, um, he had it moved because he knew all the traffic would be going by and he was politically well connected. Uh, I believe he was a federal judge. Um, very interesting man. Uh, somebody ought to do the biography of him. And uh, that that's why I got the name The Judge's Shack. And uh, anyway, that's as it stands today. They extended that porch there. Okay, we can go on a little further. Um, this is by a photographer. Um, I've been mispronouncing his name. And this is the terrible thing about writing one of these books and then not looking at it for a couple of years. You forget the names of people. He lived in Island, Island Heights. He was from the Montclair area. And I kept coming across the same photos in a number of places. And this is one of the nicest ones I've ever seen. And you can cannot really see it here, but if you look uh, maybe a on the left-hand side, come in maybe a quarter of that picture. There are poles there, and you know, wow, great, you got it. Those are pound poles. Um, any, any of you unfamiliar with how the pound poles worked? They basically, in the springtime, they'd put the poles in, they'd have uh, rings that they'd put on, and they'd attach it to net and lay the net on the bottom, and then they'd put a wall net around it, and with a V entrance and the fish would swim into it. They'd wait a day or two and then raise that bottom net and they'd have a whole catch there. And this was common all the way along, along the shoreline and Seaside Park was a major processing center where they used the railroad tracks to get the fish to the markets in Philadelphia and New York. But this photo actually shows them. As a kid growing up in Lavalette, some poles were standing in Lavalette. And the lifeguards, the big challenge was to swim out to them because they, they were out there close to a quarter of a mile. It was a good swim. And uh, we're getting close to the end, I think. Um, I put this in because uh, it's kind of a fun part of it. This is the original bridge, and this made it possible to uh, get motor vehicles across. It was a toll bridge. And they have, a, in the book, I put the actual... Uh, price list of what it costs to cross the bridge. And it included people on bicycles, on motorcycles. They even had it broken down to uh, pigs, uh, nickel a pig, uh, and uh, even a man with a wheelbarrow. So uh, it's kind of a, one of the humorous things looking back on it now. We'd never think of what it must have been like to drive animals across the bridge like that. And it was a counterweighted bridge. And uh, that was pretty much removed entirely in the 50s, I believe. Because I can remember uh, the wooden boardwalk bridge that came after that. It was lower. Okay. This I put in because I, I, I think it, it carries a theme about Island Beach. I, I, the, the people I met that had shacks that would talk to me, uh, they were very much self-reliant people. We don't need electricity. We don't need wells. We'll bring it in with us. Um, the way I see it is these are people that today would go to Alaska, but this was a lot more convenient and a lot less travel. But th this, this vehicle uh, captures the sense of self-reliance. He's got his boat, he's got his motor. There's a fuel can, a five gallon can there. He's got a little um, cupboard there on the side for food and hooks and whatever. And if you notice that, I, I spent a lot of time looking at these photos. That, that fishing pole that's coming out the window, that's probably running underneath his steering wheel between his legs. This is what I call real self-reliance. He, he's, he's got his whole preservation right there. Okay, are we at the end? We got any more? One 
so we have a question on Facebook from Michelle and it's about this picture. So I just want to step back for a second. She's asking, did the train cross the bay um, at 5th or 14th Street in Seaside Park? Do you know? Uh, it's, let's see, when you come over the, the overpass, you're looking right at the street that it went into. I have, I think in the book, a postcard that shows actually the street and the hotel that was there, I think is the building is still stands. It's been renovated numerous times. How's this picture? Gordon. Oh, you got it. All right, let me- Is uh, that from the book? There you go. Let me that, just, the, the hotel on the right-hand side, I think that structure is still there. So it's whatever that street is. I don't know Seaside Heights streets that well. So it's I, the thing. So I'm just going to talk for a second so that the people on Facebook can hear it because the screen is when you when you talk it hears it. So for those of you on Facebook, Gordon is describing this picture. It's a postcard from a long time ago um, of where the bridge used to go over from Island Heights to Seaside. Um, so you can kind of see that. And if you purchase the book, you'll be able to see all of the pictures. So yeah, there we go. All right, I'm going to share my screen again so that everyone can see the pictures. Um, awesome. All right, hopefully that answers Michelle's question. And then we have the beach buggy and then we have Rosa Lagosa. I just put there to get a little bit of color in there and when you had asked earlier why I was interested in, in doing this story, um, growing up in Lavalette, I couldn't go into Island Beach because we didn't have a beach buggy and we didn't have a, a, a state fishing pass. Uh, my dad would just fish at the end of Trenton Avenue and I go up there as a kid, and I didn't really have a lot of reasons to go to another place, but I do remember seeing uh, the, where the pound boats would bring their fish in. Uh, it turns out one of the fellows that was a lot of color in Lavalette was a guy by the name of Joe Yokobanis. He spoke with a heavy accent, probably Polish, and uh, he was kind of uh, the odd man in Lavalette. I guess every small town has one. All winter long, he would go swimming. So you'd see him in December with a towel on his shoulder and a uh, bathing suit with a belt in it that was completely out of fashion 30 years earlier. And he was going up there to dip, but he had worked there. He was a, a team driver um, of the horses that would pull the pound boats, which were like supersized lifeguard boats. And he used to drive them. Anyway, um, it wasn't until I was much older, probably in my 20s, that I first got to go into Island Beach. And I was just taken with the solitude and the beauty of it. Um, and, and I just went nuts taking pictures there. And it, at first, you know, I think when you're younger, you kind of take it for granted. You don't think it's that interesting. But you spend a little time there uh, and you start seeing the wonderful qualities. Um, I found a quote which I've put in the front of the uh, the book. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read that to you. It's from Rachel Carson's Under the Sea Wind. She said, to stand at the edge of the sea, to sense the ebb and flow of the tides, to feel the breath of a mist moving over a great small marsh, to watch the flight of shorebirds that have swept up and down the surf lines of the continents for untold thousands of years, is to have knowledge of things that are as nearly eternal as any earthly life can be. Um, and those are my sentiments better than I could ever have said them or even read them. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen really quick and I just wanna ask you one more question before I open it up to everyone. So for those of you who are on Facebook, please drop comments below so we can see them. And uh, if you're on Zoom, please drop your comments in the chat or we'll get you unmuted. But um, in the meantime, how did you come up with the title, A Sonnet in the Sands? I, I love it. And I'm just curious what inspired you to name it that. Well, the, the word poetry kept coming to mind when I was working on this. I, I, I said, this place is poetic. It's, it's got a rhythm and it's, it's got a meter to it. Um, but but it's not a poem and somehow the word sonnet came to mind i had to look up because i'm uh, you know of course a shakespeare sonnet guy and uh, i thought well this this really captures there's there's music to this place 
um, and it's hard to define. And, and a sonnet's kind of hard to define too. I, I think it's 21 verses broken down so many ways, but um, I, I like the idea that a sonnet can be any number uh, of things. It, it, it's more the song of it than anything. Well, I, I can understand the rhythm there. Uh, this year with COVID-19, I'm learning more and more about the rhythm because I get to spend more time there and just watching each thing bloom and each thing migrate, um, naturally anyways. And then there's the pattern of the people, of course. Um, but Willie, Willie DeCamp is asking a question. Um, uh, all the old time photos of the beach towns to the north seem to show houses or hotels with no vegetation anywhere around them. Have you noticed that and why is that? Well, I think because everybody buys everything now, you know, you, you buy it from the nursery, you uh, get it from, you can get flowers at the grocery store. Um, people don't want to deal with the maintenance. Uh, I, I'm amazed that people that throw stones on top of the sand. Um, I mean, I spent most of my youth in barefoot. It was only when we went to church, I had to put on shoes. I'd go a whole week without shoes. And back then, uh, they required that you recycle. You you weren't required to recycle. You got two cents a bottle, and if it was the big bottles, you got a nickel. So as a kid, you'd scrounge up bottles, and you didn't find glass anywhere in the road. Now it's you, you're taking your feet in your hands, uh, literally, uh, if you walk around barefoot. Um, and and I, I don't know. I, I just hate to see a stone thrown on top of the the sand. Yeah, we always talk about native plants being better than sand as far as, um, you know, filtering water before it gets to the bay. So I can, I can um, relate to that. Um, Christine is asking uh, what year the beach buggy picture was taken. She thinks it's the early 60s Chevy in the background. Um, it sounds about right. It's either the late 50s or early 60s. I think somebody actually pinpointed it as like 1962. It's around that point, and that was provided to me by uh, Paul. He was the president of the Beach Buggy Association, which I'd like to give a shout out to. Uh, they really do a lot for the park, and uh, were just very enthusiastic in helping me uh, um, work on this. Pro it was the help came from a lot of different networks. You know, one guy said, "I don't have it, but I know somebody does," and. I'll put them into contact with you or I'll give you their number. And it really helped out. Tremendous people I ran ran into. Um, Willie, why don't you unmute yourself for this next one? I'm not sure what you're asking. <laughs> oh, I was just, I, I have this, I'm hung up on this thing about when I see pictures of Chadwick back in the 1890s or, or Bayhead or Maloki Lavalette Seaside Park, you see these houses, lovely original houses or hotels. There is, it's as if there is no such thing as a plant in the world. They just seem to have denuded everything. So I think some people look at those pictures and they just think, well, a hurricane came through. But it's thinking about Island Beach that makes me think that something weird was going on. They, they must have been pretty determined when they built the towns to have it not be like Island Beaches, to maybe it was fear of mosquitoes or something. I'm just wondering how they got rid of all that that vegetation. It must have been a feat. And no one, I, I just never get an answer. So I was trying that the question on, on you. It's not quite yeah, well, the, the point. Only, well, the only thing I can offer to that is my family, we lived in Roselle Park and had places in Lavalette for years. Uh, I spent every summer of my life up until I was 26 in. Uh, in Lavalette for the summer. And when I was in 1955, when we moved down year round, uh, I got poison ivy all the time. So that, that's part of it. Is getting, that's one part of the, the component. But there used to be a lot of beach plum around and now people are trying to reintroduce it. It seems kind of crazy that it went away in the first place. Uh, you'll see a lot on West Point Island. Uh, uh, off a lot of that though. And when I went to high school in Point Pleasant, they used to call us the camels because we came in over the dunes. Uh, that, that was the pejorative <laughs> term, term for uh, people from Lavalette. Wow. 
Now, uh, if you don't mind me asking, how many of you have um, gotten the book? I have it. I haven't read it yet. I've just looked at it. Well, we I, can't hear, Grace Ann, we're not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. I wrote this book with the intention of you can get through this whole book by looking at captions. Yeah. Uh, I think really good captions really make you move through something like this. It's pretty dense to read. There are people. The, the thing I like is a good caption will draw you in. Uh, the photo will draw you in. The caption will help you uh, kind of take ownership of it. And then you can find the parts that fit your personal interests. And that's what I've tried to do with, uh, uh, with this book and the book on lifeguarding. Um, just to give myself another plug, um, I have two other books that I've written. Um, uh, besides uh, All Summer Long Tales and Lore of Life Gone in the Atlantic, I have one called Cuban Blues about my experiences in Cuban prisons. I'm trying to get um, uh, um, maybe sell that for uh, being developed as a screenplay. And the other book is uh, Children of the Sky, The Odyssey of Alvaro Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. It's a piece of American history that has not been. Uh, really covered. Uh, it involves an expedition that landed. Uh, have any of you heard the name Cabeza de Vaca before? It means cow's head. And somehow when I was in sixth grade, we took a test that had Ponce de Leon and De Soto and uh, Balboa, Cortez, all these different explorers. And one was Cabeza de Vaca. And that always stuck in my head because cow's head, who, who wants that for a title? And it turned out it was an honorific title that had been given to a great, great, great grandfather who would help defeat the Moors in Spain. He landed in an expedition in the Tampa Bay area in 1528. Eight years later, the only four survivors came out on the West Coast. So their footnote in history, the first Europeans to cross the North American continent. And what happened in those eight years uh, became an obsession with me. Why was it four survived out of 300? What did these four men have? And one of them was a black man. So arguably it's the first African hero in what became the United States. And he became vital to the ex, um, expedition because he was a more, he, uh, presumably spoke Arabic and Spanish and could communicate better with the natives because he understood syntax better. And these these four were imprisoned, uh, not imprisoned, they became slaves to the natives that they met in the Padre Island, Galveston area of Texas. And eventually they broke away after eight years and became medicine men and were phenomenally successful. So much so that people believe they raised the dead. This, this is American history. It just, it blows my mind that we don't even know about this. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's a screenplay that I'm trying to sell. If any of you knows anybody with a hundred million dollars that would like to support this film, please help me out. We'll, we'll do a one man quick, uh, uh, what do you call it, Kickstarter. So we have, um, so for those of you, uh, so Michelle on Facebook said that uh, her and her brother both own the book. Um, I'm sitting with Kevin's copy. Willie has a copy. Um, and Christine ordered hers. It should be here tomorrow. So it looks like there's a handful of people um, that do have your book. And then Mira raised her hand. And I just want to see um, if she has a question to ask you. Um, let me see. I don't know if I'm saying your name. Mira Green, if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question. Please do. All right, well, if she unmutes them, we'll get there. Um, so please, of course, drop your questions in the, in the box, but I have a few left. Um, and so uh, what was your favorite chapter to work on? I mean, there's all the di these different components. The one that was hardest to work on, probably, it, it's the shipwrecks to uh, define where the shipwrecks took place. Some, they, they were on the margins of Seaside Park and Island Beach. It's hard to tell. The stories related to them, one in particular uh, that's recounted in the book is the AG ropes. All I had read was uh, it was a coal barge. And this was 
1910 or 1912, it, it, the, the, if you understand the way the Coast Guard stations were, worked, or the life-saving stations they were called back then, um, the, the guys would go on a patrol at night and have flares with them and would look for any signs of disturbance, particularly during rough weather, and they'd go up to the next, next um, station and swap a token to prove that they had done their walk that night. And in the dark and in the, the heavy blowing wind, one of the guys walking the beach started seeing debris wash up on the beach. And uh, so he knew some kind of a dilemma was going on there. He went back to the life-saving station. They got a boat, rolled it down there. Daylight broke out and way in the distance, about a quarter of a mile, they saw a, uh, the remnants of a ship and a mast with what they perceived to be a person way up in the rigging. They tried to launch a boat three times. These are very experienced boatmen. They could not get through the breakers. They finally decided to try the Lyle gun, which would shoot a small projectile with a thin line on it. They could put that in the mast and kind of pull a pulley system. But by the time they got the Lyle gun, the, the mast had gone over. There was no opportunity to, to rescue them pieces of that ship are still on the beach not far from the judge's shack, but they're buried in the dunes currently, but a big storm and they'll be revealed again. I found out that the AG Ropes was a record-breaking clipper ship. And when the age of sail was giving way to the steel and powered vessels, the, the sailing vessels lost their value. This one was damaged going to um, Japan, and they decided rather than put the money into the rigging and all, that they just sell the boat, which they could sell for pennies on the dollar, and it was converted into a barge with another vessel. And it turns out, the thing that led me to this is I read that two ships wrecked on the same night. It's because they were attached to each other running running on a hawser that went all the way up to a tugboat and then back to the other boat. And they had five crew on each of those coal barges keeping the, the boat steady. And it broke loose somehow from the tugboat. There was an inquiry. Everyone in the tugboat said, no, it snapped a pound bowl uh, pole or something of that nature. And the, the vessels were adrift. And the inquiry determined that someone on one of the two boats threw out an anchor. And when they did that, the vessel started in the wind and the current started coming closer to each other and smashing each other. So the two vessels went at the same time. So it's a very dramatic story. So um, that was very interesting to me. There was another one where they rescued 300 people off the beach. It took them three days. While the, the vessel was stuck on the shoals, the, the passengers were allowed to come ashore because the crew were the last ones to leave. The captain came ashore to enlist help to get them off. They shot a bunch of Lyle guns and they had a whole bunch of uh, breaches buoys going back and forth rescuing the people over three days while the hull is getting pounded. The crew uh, snapped the locks on the liquor locker and started drinking. When the captain got back on the vessel, uh, he had a mutiny. Can you imagine this? You're right on the shoals, hundreds of feet away, and they get into a fight. The captain has two pistols. He fires both of them. They both misfire, probably wet from the journey over in the boat. And somebody hit him so hard in the head with probably a, a pail or a bucket that they thought he would lose his eye. This made the headlines in the New York Times and I got that account, but it took me 18 months to find out what edition of the New York Times it was. It was December 23rd, 1856, right before Christmas. Wow. And people came on the beach. They had 300 people on the beach. And in the New York Times account, one of the people said they passed by a drunken sailor who had frozen on the beach. And then I thought, well, boy, wouldn't it be something to find that skeleton? 
Um, just amazing story. And those people walked, what, 20, 25 miles to get to Point Pleasant, which was really the only inhabited thing to, of any scale. One of the people said that there was a guy, um, is it Tony Allen's Cove? What's the name of the cove? Johnny, Johnny Allen's Cove. Uh, Johnny Allen's Cove. One of the people that was recorded in the New York Times in this edition from 1856 said there was this miserable cottage or, or shack and that this guy gave him everything he had off the shelves to feed the people. And they talked about what a deplorable Johnny Island's place was, but how big hearted the guy was to give up all his food for, uh, you know, they could only put 30 people in, in one of the, the life saving stations with a stove. And those people have gone like three, four days in wet clothes. And, uh, and they, 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 uh, many of them survived, but this one guy froze on the beach and that, that haunted me. I had to find out more about that story. So there, there's a lot of stories of tragedy and there's stories of success there. And, that, and, and it was the shipwrecks that I found most amazing, especially since the, the first time I really spent time in the judge's shack to, to do my research, uh, Bill Bolger said, you want to see where the, the AG ropes is? And we walked down and you could just see a little bit of the bow poking up in the sand. Um, and it was just amazing to see this piece of history that's been there for, what, 150 years? It's pretty amazing. I, I wonder if I can, if, if there's still something exposed now for any of the shipwrecks. I find that really interesting as well. Um, yeah, I have pictures of different ones, but none of them were that clearly defined as that one. That one uh, apparently it was, and it wasn't that far from a life-saving station. So it's easy to understand how they could have made the attempt to get the boat launched. But you got to wonder what those seas must have been like for these people that took drilled once a week. They used to go out in the boats. They, the uh, the life saving station. They had a regular set of drills each day of the week. They did something. Um, there, there's uh, an interesting photo in the book. It also appears in the movie. Have any of you seen the Guardians about the guys that jump out of the Coast Guard helicopters and rescue people? That's one of my favorite movies. Is it? Well, if you get to watch it again, watch the end credits. It's basically an homage to the people that have risked their lives and lost their lives to rescue. And in there, there's a picture of the life-saving station in Island Beach, the, the one that we know today as you pull in. And there's uh, like six guys there coiling in their lines from their, their drills. And it's a real study in men. Um, I've worked enough with men on different types of crews and this, they all fall into, it, there's a place for everyone. And in this one, there's three guys that are working, coiling the lines, making sure they go into the fake box so that it, it'll all weave and, and won't tang, uh, uh, um, what do you call it when you're, you're spinning real blocks up, um, back, backlash basically of the line. I can't think of the proper word. Any, anyway, so you got these three guys working. There's one guy that clearly is telling a story. There's one guy, he avoids the work by amusing everybody so they don't notice that they're toiling. And then about six feet away from the guys that are working, there's a guy there with a cigarette dangling from his lip, his hands in his pocket, avoiding all the work that everybody else is doing. And I found this other pictures from different occasions. And every time this guy appears, he's got a cigarette butt and his hands are in his pocket. You know, so there's little humorous things that you see that never really become a part of the book uh, so much, but it's a photo to look forward to. And it gives you some of the detail about that and the films that have been made at Island Beach. There's um, the one that sticks out the most is the, um, oh dear, it's a Stephen King film. Uh, it's a series of vignettes of horror stories. That was shot there with Ted Danson and, uh, and Leslie Nielsen. And then there were a couple others that didn't really go too far anywhere. Oh, uh, Stealing Home with uh, uh, Tom Harmon, and not Tom Harmon, uh, 
I'll tell you, names are escaping me today, and I don't know where anything is in the book. Kevin's scratching his head, but there was uh, there's a show that was, um, the pilot of a of the new show was filmed there this past year. Um, oh, really? Yeah, it was. Um, oh gosh, I don't know if they continued the show, but it was it was a popular one for a few. It was like a plane crash. Does anyone remember? Um, it was on like popular TV, and it was the first. The pilot of the show was a plane crashing on the beach, and they filmed at Island Beach State Park last year, and it's aired already. Um, so Island Beach has had a few few moments of stardom there. Um, but uh, we're getting to about 10 minutes of, and we like to keep things to an hour so that everyone is, our attention is kept. So I have a few more questions, but I just want to, again, ask, oh, Emergence on ABC. Thank you, Jason. You're a solid. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to check out the pilot of Emergence, you'll see Island Beach Park. Um, I remember that that week or two that they were there, like the road was closed and there was all kinds of debris and like police cars racing up and down the road. It was like a whole big um, fiasco. Um, but does, oh, Michelle's, yep, you got it right, Michelle on Facebook. <laughs> she said it too. Um, does anyone have any questions for Gordon? Um, you can check out Gordon's website. He has a website, um, gordonhess.com. And uh, you can purchase his book with um, Jersey Shore Publishing, I believe is the name of the publisher, right? Um, Jersey Shore Publications, yeah. For publications. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, it is gorgeous. Um, there's uh, about 10 photographers who, have, who were commissioned to add um, photos to the book. And they're all gorgeous photos of birds and wildlife, fishermen, sunsets, sunrises. Um, the shafts, the people, there's just so many different elements of this book. So you should definitely check it out if you haven't already. Um, so if anyone, if no one has any questions, I have one last one for you and hopefully it's a fun one. And that's, what is your favorite thing to do when you're at Island Beach State Park? I never get to do it is go in the water. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I've, I live in Delaware now and everyone here goes to the beach. And of course we go to the shore. Um, but I, I never tire of going in the water. I love to body surf. Um, I'd love to get up on a surfboard, but I found out, uh, in your seventies, it's, you got to keep it, stay with it to do that. But it, I, you know, it's great to be there and the, the beach is wonderful. Uh, I find it's a good place to kind of, uh, reset your internal, uh, mechanisms. It's, uh, it is poetic there. It is a place where time is kind of timeless. You see clouds like you never see them anywhere else, it seems to me. Uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful place, and uh, you're fortunate to live so close by to it. And it's one, I, I mean, uh, one of the, the, the most amazing things I saw in all the time I'd lived in Lavalette and lifeguarded, watching out on the water, I'd never seen horses with riders run at full steam through the surf, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. Just lovely, and things like that don't happen uh, very often at the shore, but when you're there, it's really a great experience. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here and for um, spending your hour with us so we can learn more about Island Beach and your book. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we've been featuring uh, a new book every month and a new uh, author every month. So uh, this has been our fourth um, book and our third event. We'll have an event for the Bayman eventually when COVID is all um, over. Uh, but Willie's suggesting that we have you over at the Eco Center. Um, we have an Eco Center in to downtown Tom's River, uh, which is 40 acres of Green Acres property. It's open space and recreation. And we have a beautiful outdoor classroom called River Time. And uh, when we're not in COVID, where we're all social distancing, we'd love to have you um, come there and be a part of that one of our programs there um, either speaking about your book or speaking about the your other books or history um, It's a beautiful place and for those of you who are on please feel welcome to be there even though it's closed for COVID You can walk the trails. It's right along the Tom's River and uh, it's all open dawn to dusk So you can go there and enjoy a walk a peaceful walk um, where in Tom's River there isn't as much open space to be in so um, I'm still deciding what our next book is going to be. Uh, our book for August, I'm hoping, is either going to be The Tom's River, which is a book about Siva Geigy, 
or um, the, a book about storms, super storms, not super storm Sandy, but storms at the Jersey Shore. So we're still trying to figure out what events um, we can um, schedule with authors. So I still have one day left of July. So I'll let you all know what the book is for um, August. And don't forget to check out um, Barney Bay Book Club on Goodreads. That's where I've been having everybody kind of um, collect uh, so that you can see what books we've read and what books we're going to read. And uh, of course, stay in touch with us on Facebook and uh, on our website, savebarneydebay.org and all our social media sites. So if no one has any other questions, um, oh, yeah, Christine's commenting on my earrings. I have seahorse earrings on. We caught a seahorse today during our sailing video. It was awesome. So we went sailing uh, over by the inlet, Gordon, every th Thursday at 10 a.m. we do a video. Um, and we show everyone the fish that we caught. And we caught seahorse today, and we also caught um, a spotflin butterfly fish who came up in the Gulf Stream. So that was kind of cool. Uh, yeah. So um, your earrings. <laughs> <They're sweet. no> problem. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone for tuning on in Zoom. Thank you everyone for being on Facebook, and uh, we'll see you next time. Catch it on YouTube. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Grace Ann. Awesome. Thank all you right. all for coming.